Um, let's start with the train drivers and the pay rise. Tories accusing Labour of caving in. Uh, mm. It's 15%. It's not all. It's not like a big 15% rise. It's scattered over three years, so around about 5% a year. But Mick Whelan, the ASLEF leader, very, very happy about it. Said it's a good, fair offer over these years, which will end the union's two-year campaign for better pay. Um, what are you making of this? Well, I think it's interesting that, as you say, it's it's fifteen percent, but it's two of those. There's five percent is backdated to twenty two, twenty three, four point seven five percent from last year, and four point five percent from this year. So it's essentially the, the the problem that the train drivers had was they felt that there was their pay was not going up commensurate with inflation. Mm. As we know, obviously twenty twenty two inflation was really high. It's come down now, but wages have not kept up, and so that's why they've been asking for this rather large pay rise. I think. I think if you're a conservative and you see someone like Mick Whelan saying he's very happy with it, and that probably sets alarm bells ringing because if Mick Whelan's very happy with a deal from the government, then they probably yes. offered. Yes, if Whelan's lot, happy about anything, you know, Whelan's never happy in a chippy, for goodness sake. But, you know, it's, I mean, look, there's a bit, a bit of me that goes fair play to him. That's, that's specifically his job as yeah. the union leader. Of course it is. I guess there's always the caveat that it's, you know, it is taxpayers' money we're talking about here. But it has to be said that whatever the government were doing in the last few years, there were quite a lot of Conservatives that I spoke to that said, actually, we think you should give these guys a pay rise. So it wasn't completely down separate party lines. No, and I, I think the, the issue that the current Conservatives have is that this is what's called a no-strings-attached deal. So this does not come with a load of conditions attached to it. And that was one of the big... Um, stopping points really from yeah. getting a deal over the line was essentially was that there was a feeling from the government at the time that there was a lot of uh, outdated working practices and actually that any sort of bumper pay rise had to come with changes in working practices that would lead to sort of more modern um you know train companies in the future obviously that has been junked essentially for this potential yeah. deal and so i think it's quite interesting you talked about kind of taxpayers money i thought bridget phillips in the education secretary was out on the media around this morning and she couldn't really answer where that money was coming from and i think that's going to lead to more attacks from the tories that essentially it's going to come for passengers and taxpayers that are going to pay for this rise whether you think it's rightly or wrong that's, that's yeah, yeah. where it looks like it's probably going to come well that, that is the point isn't it and even if you are absolutely behind you know the, the increase that's been given here um when you renew your season ticket or when you have to pay. Uh, of course, we already live in a very, very expensive country when it comes to public transportation. Um, yeah. That's where I think even the greatest supporters start to slightly dilute their, uh, their support for this. Yeah, and I think as well, if you looked at, obviously there was not just strikes on the railways, there were strikes in lots of other industries over the past couple of years, and the public support, YouGov did lots of surveys of how, how, what, how percentage of the public support the strikers, yeah. you know, railway strikes always came the furthest down it was nurses at the top and then yep. doctors then other people it was they were never really a huge amount of public on their side and so whether those people who sit back and now see that these people have got 15 percent they might think that perhaps it's is it's unwarranted but as you say mick whelan's done his job he's played hardball and and obviously with you know with a new transport secretary in place yeah. he's managed to get a deal over the line it looks like and of course it means and again people will debate this forever you know what what constitutes a skilled job what is an essential job what's a qualified job etc it would and, and let's remember not every one of the as left members are trained drivers and not all trained drivers are at the top of the tree of trained drivers but no. uh, it does mean that those that are driving in in that particular area that we're referring to who earn an average of 64,000 a year will be just shy of 70,000 a year mm. under that now that's twice more than twice the average wage and there will be some who look at that and think well you know that's a lot of money for that it's a, it's a responsible job we all get it but it's still a lot of money yeah I, th I think you're right although obviously we are asking train drivers to do a lot more obviously with the fact there's lack, lack of conductors and other kinds of they are they've got a, a, a larger job to do and i think i've spoken to people in, you know, in the sector who say that it is kind of commensurate with the level of skill you know it's not something that i guess you necessarily understand until you've been involved with it but you're right obviously the figures those are specific figures they're not yeah. representative of all train drivers it's people in specific areas down in the southeast and obviously it goes with the kind of the higher living costs and stuff but yeah i, th I think you're right and that's as, as i go back to that's why i think public support was lower for them because I think people felt, you know, people think about nurses were quite badly paid, but actually train drivers were already paid pretty decently for, yeah, yeah. for the job they've done. Yeah, I think there's a, a I mean, that, that's, I know it's the most seductive comparison, but it's a real one that, you know, frontline public sector workers, 
nurses earn far less, far less than a train driver. And I think that's difficult for many people to square that circle. Let's move on mm. to um, Rachel Reeves. And, you know, we just alluded to uh, in, in that last section, Alan, you know, where will the money come from? Well, mm. you know, we've got a little bit of growth happening, 0.6%. Uh, in the second quarter, according to the ONS. So a bit of a boost for Rachel Reeves, but we do know that tax rises are on the way and some of them could be quite significant. Yeah, absolutely. This this uh, is, is, is good news. And I think actually it's another example of why Rishi Sunak by calling the election when he did, there's a lot of criticism that, of the timing of it because the whole point of their kind of Tory campaign of the past year was that things were going in the right direction. This is a further example that perhaps things were turning a corner and, and instead they're not, the Tories are not going to be around to, to reap any of the benefits yeah, from yeah. it. It's going to be a Labour Treasury that's going to have potentially this kind of extra headroom to do the things they want to do. But as you say, I think that given how difficult the scenario was when Rachel Reeves came in and how hard they're hammering this message that there was a big black hole to fill. I think that regardless of how good the economic news is going to be over the next few months, I don't think they're going to deviate from that message because I think they want to give themselves the best opportunity they can. If they are going to raise taxes, which it looks like they might do, the first budget when you're still riding high, when there's still a hangover from the previous government is the time to do it. So I think that Rachel Reeves is not going to be knocked off course by this, despite how good some of the economics, I mean, I saw it described by one analyst today is the, is the economy going gangbusters you know the, the, for, for a Labour Treasury that's very unhelpful they want to be seen not as going particularly well at the moment so yeah. they have to make these difficult decisions. It's interesting going back to Rishi Sunak calling the general election the more I look into that and I'm sure you, you have on many occasions Alan the more mysterious it is it seems that <laughs> quite literally only Rishi and his dog knew about this date and it kept very very secret um, mm. and I can only think that it rested on channel migration really that they knew, I mean, the numbers we've seen now, 5,000 people across the channel since Keir Starmer became Prime Minister, I don't imagine for one second that would have been any different under Rishi Sunak, but it would have looked so much worse, of course, because he was promising to stop the boats. Bearing mm. in mind, as you rightly say, you know, infl I know inflation's just taken a little, little notch northwards, but broadly speaking, inflation down, interest rates are coming down, much easier, or slightly easier to get a mortgage, uh, economy growing. And if you fast forward that to about October, November, those figures are likely to again be better. So they would have known that. But so it must, it could only have really rested on the optics of channel migration. That's all I can really think. Yeah, I think I think child migration and of course Rwanda. I think as well. Yeah. I think that the idea was was to have an election based on the idea of the Rwanda policy and have a kind of a wedge issue between Labour and the Conservatives. The Tories want to do this, and Labour don't want yes. to do this. And and by having uh, by having the election before any flights were due to take off. Remember, they were meant to take off at the yeah. beginning of July, so just after when the election would have taken place. So I think that was part of the dividing line. You're right. The economic argument it never really made sense to go early. It was the best argument was to go sure. as long as possible and to give yourself enough quarters for the economy to, to turn around. But yeah, I think it was other issues that took place. And, and you're right, it, it's become more and more of a mystery and more mysterious the longer it goes on. And there Indeed. are more and more people who lost their seats who now feel the timing of it really didn't help. A lot of people had planned to go out campaigning over the summer to help raise funds over the over the summer to fight yep. the campaign. And they weren't given the opportunity. It's interesting. And I also think with Rwanda, that even if it did get off the ground, I don't think the numbers would have been significant enough for it to look successful if it you know it wouldn't have perhaps even changed the amount of people crossing and if if it had got to I don't know September and Rwanda was up and running but only 23 people had gone that was almost a worse look than nobody going because at least Stam, uh, at least Sunak could claim well you know I'm being scuppered and you know there's yeah. a process yeah, I think so. I think if you'd had an August where it was, um, you know, hot weather and calm seas, then regardless of the deterrent, that's going to be the pull factor that's going to yeah. drag people uh, across. So, so you're right, I suppose, in, in that sense, that it was better to it was better to fight on the concept of Rwanda than perhaps it, in practice, but not having worked particularly yeah. well or, or particularly been successful so far. Indeed.